Good morning, Peter. Good morning. How you doing? I'm doing okay. We have uh, Peter Siebert with us from the Independent Seaport Museum in Philadelphia. And Peter, it's a real honor to have you on and to, for you to share some stories about your career and all of the changes you've seen over the years in our industry. And we wanted to kind of just jump right off and I'd like you to share a little bit about your time in Pennsylvania, uh, starting out in museums. Yeah. So, I mean, thank you for having me. This is great. I very much appreciate it. There's, there's nothing quite so much fun as talking about your career, especially when, the, you know, my kids, I, I tease them, they aren't army brats, they're history brats. We've <laughs> moved so many times and done so many things. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's definitely been an interesting, interesting run. So, uh, you know, I got my bachelor's degree from, from Penn State and, and uh, after two years before that at Dickinson and went to work as the curator at Cumberland County Historical Society, which we have in common. And I was hired under a, a federal grant, which is how a lot of people get into the museum business. And was there about a year and then went to part time because that's what they could afford and was lucky enough that I actually a job popped up uh, back in uh, my hometown of Harrisburg uh, to be the curator of the Dauphin County Historical Society. So um, made the jump over full-time beats part-time. And so it was great. About three months into being curator, I came in one morning and found in my desk a set of keys and a note. And it said, congratulations, you're the new director. The old director had quit. <laughs> And I was 21 years old, running a county historical society, um, and just didn't have the, you know, this this was a big eye opener for me because I was at a point where I thought I'm going to be a curator, I'm going to go down that road, and now I had the chance to kind of pick and choose what I wanted, and uh, I had a board that was really understanding. I had a great board president, um, and she was incredibly supportive. And frankly, she and the others said, you need to take the director road, not the curatorial road. Mm. So I stayed there, got my master's degree during that time at night, which was, you know, you had to do, have to do still. Um, was there five years and a position popped up in Lancaster, the Heritage Center of Lancaster County. And it was an interesting time to come there because I was the third director in one year. Um, and it, it, so... How do you know? It was an interesting change for me building a career next step on a period of tumult in an organization where you know they just come through so many rough changes, mm -hmm. and it was a great opportunity. I was there 15 years, um, really um, learned about a whole lot of things that built you know helped build my career, particularly about you know state funding streams and what we used to call walking around money. Now it's legislatively directed grants, but right. lambs is what we all knew it as. And had a really, you know, it was a great time. And at the end of 15, I'm like, you know, maybe it's time to think about a change. Yeah. Um, my mother had passed away and I had been caring for her. Um, and so uh, it was a really good opportunity for me to sort of make the leap to go to another institution. And, and it was an interesting leap because I still love museums. But I went to an organization called the National Council for History Education. And NCHE was a marriage between museums, K through 12 history teachers, and academics. If I had one more hand, this would make a lot more sense. And we were there to promote teaching good history at the K through 12 level. And in my time at you know, running a county historical society and then running the museum, I realized that you know, our biggest challenge was that we had a generation who simply was not getting history in the schools. And as they were aging through, we were then having another generation, another generation, and it was piling up and it, this needed to be addressed. And so it was a, a cool opportunity to be with an organization that had a national footprint, national affiliates. Um, we were a provider of teaching American history grants one of the two big ones in the country that provided professional development for teachers, funded by TAH. It was awesome. Um, and then the Tea Party came to power in Washington, D.C. They had budget sequestration, and one of the victims of that was the Department of Education's grants, including the Teaching American History Grant Program. 
And so TAH died and when TAH died, my budget went into a tailspin, a huge sure. one. I mean, three quarters of our revenue disappeared. And so I spent the time really reshaping the organization, looking at new revenue streams, looking at what we could do. And it was, it was cool because, you know, I could call David McCullough or Eric Foner or, 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 you know, Ken Jackson or any of these sort of living legend historians and they would work for us and it was, and they were on my board and it was awesome, but it was also a really challenging time financially with, hmm. you know, having lost our funding stream. And so when the Millicent Rogers Museum in Taos, New Mexico posted, it was kind of a kid's dream at that point because I'm like, you know, I had, I had spent my childhood wintering in, in Arizona with my grandparents. So I love the Southwest and I had had a, had traveled there a lot. And so I was like, hey, cool, let's, let's do something crazy. Let's pick up the entire family and move to New Mexico. And so we moved to Taos and it was wonderful. The museum focused on historic Spanish and Native American communities. And I saw my opportunity as being able to address those communities today, bring them into the museum, engage with them. Um, and that was awesome. I mean, it gave our family, and that's the cool part I think about our business. You had this opportunity to do all sorts of things that most people would never dream of. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had the chance to go to the White House a couple of times. I've also had the chance to, you know, go to one of the Indian Pueblos and eat have Easter dinner with a family at their table um, and then go to the basket dance. And this was all at Santa Alfonso Pueblo or um, to go to Taos Pueblo on New Year's and be invited in with a family whose home has been occupied you know, for like 500 years. Mm. Uh, incredible experiences. But I think the challenge, and I think it's a counsel that I would give to people in the museum business is to realize that visiting a place and living someplace are not always the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that while it was wonderful opportunity professionally, it was a challenge for our family. Um, New Mexico is a challenging state economically, um, incredible poverty there and a really pretty bad school system. And I remember being in a meeting where they were cheering that New Mexico had come up a notch and it was now 49th in education. They had beaten Mississippi by a couple of points. And I'm thinking, man, I, I wouldn't brag about that. That's right. not grounds to applaud. And with two daughters, though, in school, one at the elementary and one in the secondary, this was not something we wanted to see. And I was really, really worried. You know, a family has always come first for me. And that's, I think, important in our business to remember that. And mm watching their educational careers, in my mind, be very sketchy. Mm -hmm. um, in New Mexico, and I used to, I use this when I talk about the failure of history education, what we do for a living. You know, my daughter would have graduated high school having only had a year and a half of social studies through the entire four years of high school. Wow. That was, it was a tertiary subject. And this was really problematic to me. And so when Colonial Williamsburg announced that they were looking for a director of historic trades and actually going to take seriously hiring from the outside. They'd always been hiring from the inside. They'd always been sort of a self-perpetuating museum. I jumped at the opportunity and so got the job and moved back east to Colonial Williamsburg where I ran the historic trades program. And it was a tough time at CW. Um, lots of economic issues within the institution that really called for a lot of compression down and, and probably the toughest time of my life, having to let people go for layoff and economic reasons. I mean, I've mm -hmm. fired people for job performance issues and I've seen people quit to do other things, but to call people in and people you've promoted or people you've encouraged, and now you have to say, we can no longer financially afford to keep you, mm -hmm. I, you know, that's a, that gets you. I mean, there's no two ways around it. And, mm -hmm. Uh, my responsibilities grew. So I went from trades to trades and skills to more and more. So by the end, I was overseeing, you know, seven or 800 people. Um, and we were open 365 days out of the year. And I, I had two phones, one on one hip and one on the other hip, because it was a constant, because we were so busy and everything was happening constantly. 
Um, it was a 24 seven job. And mm -hmm. in the middle of that all, and as I'm thinking about all this, I get a call from a headhunter, a recruiter, who mm -hmm. said, we'd love for you to come to the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. And it was a museum that I had known. And I always say to people in our business, go to see places because it really helps you in your career. Find those places you think are cool. So that if they come to you or you see them, man, you grab that opportunity because it may not come around again. Yeah. And in this case, it's a wonderful museum and I made the leap to go there um, as their CEO. And you know, it was a lot of fun, great institution, very rural state, about as rural as you can live. I think the deer and the antelope outnumbered us about a thousand to one. It, you know, yeah. eighth largest state, and there's only 500,000 people in it. But, it, you know, so it was very, very different. And we were driven by being a big tourist destination at Yellowstone. COVID came along and, and I approached it aggressively. We really tackled that hard um, and came out of it with a surplus, not a deficit, which was, I think, unique in a lot of museums. We were also among the first museums to reopen when we could, because I wasn't going to let us hamstring us. But we also didn't lay anybody off. We didn't cut anybody's pay. We didn't take anybody's benefits away. Mm. In the middle of all of that, um, my wife's father, my father, or my his mother, excuse me, my mother-in-law passed away. And my wife was really concerned about her dad and living back in Lancaster. Um, again, family comes first. And I think we have to remember that in our careers and our lives. They're just, mm -hmm. it's important. And so we had a long talk that she, we both felt it was important to get back east so she could spend time with her dad. Mm -hmm. um, and this was not a case where, oh, we'll wait a few years because a few years may not happen mm -hmm. to be able to do that. And so we returned here to the Seaport Museum. Mm -hmm. um, and this was, again, an opportunity for me in a different setting, in a very urban setting. I've been in rural and suburban and megalopolis and everything else, but I've never been in a dense urban museum before. So it's kind of cool. And with an institution that I think has got a unique mission, but one that has drifted a lot over the last number of years, mm -hmm. kind of realigning us, I think we become, a, it's, it's a great opportunity for us to grow. So. Um, you know, I did a little stint of teaching in the middle of all this mm -hmm. while I was working. I wrote two books um, and, and did some other stuff in the middle of it all. But I mean, that's, you know, as Mel Brooks said, that's highlights of Hamlet. Um, <laughs> that's kind of the once over lightly of, of, of a life very, very much built upon a career of changing jobs pretty frequently. I want to get into uh, Seaport a little bit more, but I wonder if you could share with folks something that they just never really talk about at conferences or, you know, when you go to seminars, and that is the grind on just the individual, maybe they live alone, or the family unit on, on can you speak to or give any advice on how, especially with your daughters, how you work through those moves um, and, you know, are there, was there any, you know, any, any words of wisdom you can give to help people? Because, you know, we, we talked a little before the recording that in a way you have to be willing to move in, in, in this industry. It's not like an IT job where, okay, I can go 20 minutes away, 15 minutes away and get something else. Um, how did you, how did you guys as a family cope with all of that and work through it? Well, and that's, I'm glad you asked that because you're right, it never gets talked about. And the reality is um, the, the super lifers in our business are becoming an endangered species, the people mm -hmm. who go someplace and stay their entire career. At Williamsburg, we had a lot of those folks. Um, and even in my latter ten tenure there, we were starting to hire people and lose people pretty frequently. A millennial generation that was much more used to moving. And this was devastating the older staff who were just like, you come and stay here forever. And I'm like, no, hmm. the world doesn't work that way. Um, and it was a conscious decision my wife and I, we talked about that this was gonna, we were gonna move. I won't mince words. It was harder than hell on the girls. Hmm. Um, my oldest, I moved in her junior year of high school and I had moved her before that in her eighth grade year. Wow. And those were really hard. And our little one, when we left Cody, um, you know, this, this was, she was in tears and she, and she was madder than all blazes at me. Mm. 
we are a close family and their education remains paramount to me. And it's been interesting. My oldest daughter is now in grad school. Of all things, she wants to work in this business. <laughs> Why? But anyhow, you know, she's an American in the public history program. And, you know, we've talked about the fact that as much as it was painful for her going through that, it was also the sense that she came to realize that we were living in cool places and doing things that nobody else could do. Mm. And, I, and I really do think that's what makes our business distinctive. It is our vocation and it's our avocation. So what do we do when, when we go on vacation? We go to museums. Accountants don't sit home doing other people's taxes just for fun. <laughs> you know, but we, on our fun time, go do what we do for a living. And, you know, I write history books because I'm passionate about what I do. Mm. And, you know, I, and, and so the kids grew up in a world where it was different than their friends in the sense that they were kind of living their dad's dream of being immersed in all of this. Mm. And so it was interesting with Jane, my oldest, because, you know, she's talked to me now that these experiences, which were painful for her to go through, Mm. really shaped her perspective on, on things and made her much more comfortable in a lot of things. I love hearing that, but I got to tell you, having lived through it, you know, I was the worst dad, mostly to me, that I would, I was putting my girls through with this. Mm. Um, but, you know, I seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. It is something I think you have to acknowledge the strength of your marriage. Um, and, uh, you know, I was married twice. My first marriage, I don't think we could have ever done what I've done in my career. Mm. But my wife, you know, uh, God bless her for putting up with me through all these years, had understood and embraced the idea that we're going to have to travel and do things and that my work would do that. Sometimes that's meant her career has gone on hold. Sometimes that's meant that she's found a new career path, but she approached it with an open mind. Mm -hmm. um, in all of this and, and God bless her for doing that. But I think you really, that, that has to be a corner discussion. I've known couples who have moved uh, a couple of times and that drives them apart. And I've seen children of museum people who just, you know, they move back home to live with their grandparents because they don't want to move so many times. Mm -hmm. It is part of what we do. And you see that, you know, I think in a lot of places, but it is where the museum profession is. You've got to be prepared to move. As you said quite correctly, um, you're not going to go across the street to another museum. And even if there is one across the street, they probably aren't going to hire you. You know, you'd have to hit it just right in what they were missing and you would step in. So you've got to be able to build that career by going elsewhere. And it's really the question of how far do you want to reach in doing that? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Coming back to Philly, I mean, that was a big move, a segue coming back to independence. It was. And into a big city. I mean. Yeah, no, yeah. it was. And, 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 and I think we've always, you know, I think there's always been the guidance you should move to bigger institutions all the time. I don't believe that to be true hmm. <clears throat> because frankly, we're all different from each other. There really isn't an apples to apples comparison. And I think we've all seen organizations that have done this and done this and done this and done this. Mm -hmm. And where we join them can be anywhere on that set of ladders. Mm -hmm. So you know, I came to Independent Seaport at a, at a challenging time. They had lost much of their staff during COVID permanently. Mm. And um, an institution that I think you know has, for me, is about challenge. And, and it, it took me a long time in my career to recognize that what I crave is challenge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was, I was complaining about to this, to my mentor in college. And he said, Peter, embrace the fact that you enjoy challenge. Stop beating yourself up about how all we face challenges. And every nonprofit museum has its share of them. I don't care whether they claim to be solvent and successful or not. We all have our challenges. And so yeah. it's, it's really where you see yourself able to, to affect change. That, hmm. That's what excites me. And here's one that has a lot of challenges. So that, that pushing my buttons. And, you know, the reality being in Wyoming, we were closed six weeks with COVID. Here in Philadelphia, the city kept us closed longer than even all the surrounding counties. 
and mm. it cost us a ton of money, mm. um, a ton of money. And um, that, that's been really challenging to have for the first time sort of uh, that level of intrusion on our operations that just so held us now, you know, mm -hmm. our rental income for weddings disappeared because everybody went to the surrounding counties to hold their weddings. Mm -hmm. um, whereas they used to come here. Why? Because we were shut down still. And that, that was a really brutal aspect to COVID that I don't think necessarily has been talked about a whole lot. We've talked about, oh, museums are closing and this and that. I think it's more the, the prolonged effects of things like the impact on rental income and so forth that really are beating the heck out of us all because mm -hmm. those were sta stabilizing factors in our budgets for so long. Mm. Whatever you feel comfortable disclosing or not, I was wondering if you could share. I'm, I'm, in, uh, uh, I'm in kind of the camp that a really good interview with an institution um, involves a lot of candidness and, and you can feel the rapport in the room and that both sides are very transparent in what the challenges, you know, what the challenges potentially are. And did you, did you find that coming to independence in your interview process? So I, I, I'll sort of caveat it by saying, first of all, I agree with you about the candor. And I mean, I've, I've gotten to a point in my career when I interview someone for a position that's going to report to me. Before that interview, I get the person on the phone and we have a candid conversation. Mm -hmm. And part of that is because I went through an experience with a, a professional recruiter who really didn't invest a lot of time in, in looking at their clients. And so I was sold on one thing, the client was sold on one thing, and we didn't, it took a long time to get us to figure out what the hell the reality was. Yeah. In, in coming here, I think the challenge was that, and I think this is very true when you're going through the interview process with the board, is the board has a perception of the organization that's based on a board level. Mm -hmm. and then there's the managerial reality of all of that. And often those don't align with each other. Mm -hmm. Not because one is, you know, the board is not being truthful, right. but only because they're seeing what is their priority and what they see, think is something really critical to the institution. And the reality may be something very, very different. Mm -hmm. And I think that's particularly true in organizations where the director is retiring after a long tenure. And that's not about the director retiring. It's about the fact that the organization has had a director for so many years, the board has gotten used to it. Mm -hmm. And so they have a perception that probably is different than what the reality is because they've no, they really have never known any other director. Mm -hmm. I think when you see an organization that's been through a couple of directors for whatever reason, and I've been places where I follow people who were fired, I've been places where I follow people who died on the job, Mm -hmm. And I've been places where people, you know, uh, resigned um, and places where people retired. And the perspective of the boards was very different with all of those, um, mostly because of, of the prior experience, not necessarily understanding where the organization is right now. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, you know, my, my, my I'm, I'm not keen on headhunters. I have one that I work with and I've hired to do jobs who I think is wonderful. The vast majority of them, I don't think, do a great service, mostly because they're working for the client and they're presenting the best face of that client to me, but not necessarily presenting the honest perspective on it all. Yeah. I had a call one time from a headhunter about a museum who said, I got to tell you, you probably have six months to bail this place out. Otherwise, they're going to fold. If you're up to the challenge, then let's talk. And I thought that's remarkably refreshing to hear. But I don't know who in their right mind could come into an organization and in six months turn them around. Right. They're just, there is no Hail Mary pass that any of us can do that could do that. And, and anybody who thinks they could is, is clearly delusional. And I, so it, it was refreshing to hear. I just don't think they could get anybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, um, I, you know, I, I personally, I want to hear the where the warts are um, when I'm in an, in an interview, yeah. so you can, can know what you're what you're having potentially to tackle. Right. Yeah, I think yeah. that's I think that's the challenge, and I think 
there is definitely a skill set that you build as you interview through all of that. Because one of the ones that I'm always on top of is, you know, is there an inside candidate? Mm-hmm. As if there is an inside candidate, I'm almost ready to throw up my hands and say, thank you, but no thank you. Mm-hmm. Because the board becomes, it gets into the conundrum of saying, well, if we hire the inside candidate, our job is done. We, it's a known quantity. Let's hire them. And that happens often. Mm-hmm. Or if they say, well, we ought to hire from the outside, but of course that means the insider will then quit. Well, that's two losses. We don't want that, so we'll hire the inside candidate. Mm. Or we won't tell them the, the outsider that there was an inside one and he has to figure that out. <laughs> if you now create a tension, you, you know, it's, a, it, it's, it's almost a no-win scenario in my mind uh, with as an outsider approaching an organization where there's a strong inside candidate. There's yeah. courtesy interviews. That's not what I'm talking about, but I'm talking a strong insider. Um, you know, to my mind, that's the worst one. But, and that's one as a, where I've been approached by headhunters. That's usually my very first question. Mm. Is there an inside candidate? Because that's going to color the whole conversation. Yeah. And then I spend that time looking at the numbers. I, I had one job interview where they said, uh, and they offered me the position, I turned it down. But they said, you sound more like an accountant than you sound like a museum director. And I thought, yeah, because your numbers don't add up. Um, and, you know, I go right to GuideStar and look at their 990 and pull that up. And if I see, you know, if I'm seeing there's something that makes sense, yay. If it's starting to look really weird, odd ratios, odd oddities, you know, things that are red flags, then I'm going to be quickly moving on because I think that the numbers are the one thing that I can look to with some resilience. Now, I've come to two institutions in my career where I had to fire the auditor after I got there because the auditor was making mistakes that I only found out about after I got there. And mm-hmm. so their 990s were wrong. In one place, we actually had to restate our 990s. It was that bad. Yeah. Um, so I've learned my next question is how long has your auditor been working there? Because the two places we fired the auditor, they'd been there for decades. And so they were repeating mistakes rolling forward. Yeah, I, I was in an interview one time where they, of course, I had already looked at the, the 990 information, but they gave it to me and uh, said, oh, thank you. And, but they also provided the, um, the financial, the full financial audit, uh, which I thought was really refreshing to, to get that from them. And yeah, you've got to really- have that when you go into that. When you go into the interview, you've got to have it. When you're doing your preliminary fishing around, yeah. you have that call, you're going to apply for that job. I always say go look at the 990 on GuideStar and then make your decision based on that, especially if you're looking at a director's role, because that's going to reveal to you a whole lot. It really will. And if you see, you know, I, and I, the reality is what I said to you earlier, there is no perfect situation. Mm-hmm. There is no, you know, I, I'd love to see that ideal museum that, you know, has a board of 12 and they're all fundraisers and they don't meddle in the day to day and they have a highly trained staff. And every grant they write gets funded and they, they're AM accredited and all their policies. You show me that place. You know, that's, I just don't think it exists. I, yeah. I really don't. And even in, when you get a bunch of museum directors in the room and they're all kind of past the posturing point of seeing who's the bigger and who's the better. And then they start admitting to each other the failings of their own organization. <laughs> then, they, then the truth comes out. Yeah, I, I, my board is this, or our numbers are bad, or we have an endowment manager who, who is getting me pennies on. You know, then the right. then the, the, the the cabbage, to use a Pennsylvania Dutch analogy, starts unpeeling itself when we get to see what it's like. <laughs> so now you're at uh, Independence. Tell tell us a little bit about the place and. Yeah, for people who might not know anything about it. Well, it, it's worth a Google because it, there's an interesting museum story, certainly behind this institution. We were founded in 1961, as a lot of museums were in, you know, throughout the country, as collector-based. And I have often thought, you know, going back to my first comment about you know living here and dying here, um, that uh, in, in, you probably could look at more collector-based museums in Pennsylvania than almost anywhere else in the country. Hmm. museums that came out of somebody's collection and uh, this this place was no exception and so we were in the city we were around for a bunch of years and then had a new director who came and he worked with the city and all of a sudden we moved from a building we own to a building we now rent 
um, probably not the wisest of decisions down along the waterfront in Philadelphia. And um, at that same time, we got two ships, uh, World War II submarine and uh, Admiral Bowie's cruiser from the Battle of Manila Bay, the Olympia. And that was in 1985. And the museum uh, basically moved in here, I think under the assumption that it would be a much bigger place with redevelopment. The city mm -hmm. had promised there'd be redevelopment and hey, we were going to put the forefront of that. Um, and then the museum became embroiled in a scandal. Um, and you can Google it. It's a fascinating read um, involving management and city politics and criminality. Um, and it blew up. And it's an interesting study, sadly, that we still live with of people who blame the victim rather than the criminal and who have not quite forgiven the museum, despite the fact that what happened was almost 18 years ago. Mm. But it almost destroyed the institution, mm. the, the circumstances. And so the museum has been, went through some, again, in that period, a period of, of needing to stabilize, which you have to do after crisis management. Um, and then a period, I think, hopefully beginning now of, of re regrowth and rebirth. Mm. for the institution. It's, it's an amazing place in the sense that its charge originally back in the 60s was sort of grand of all maritime history. So, you know, we have a whaling collection, we have a canal collection, and, you know, we have all sorts of stuff. And in my short seven months, it's been about really refining that down and saying, you know, we're really about the Delaware River, the Port of Philadelphia, in this immediate vicinity, that there's enough to do there that's mm -hmm. frankly probably well worth us spending the rest of what this museum's existence focusing on. Mm. So it's it's about honing our mission, which I think is really important. Um, it's about a strategic plan that we I put the board through. I think it's important when you start a new position, you go right into that strat plan. I think it makes me nuts institutions to do a strat plan and then hire the new director. I think they fail to realize the new director has to have that overlay on the plan. Forcing them to read somebody else's work doesn't do the new director's skills a lot of service. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this place after place after place, and it's just, it's such a stumbling. And here they did it, you know, last year it was a new plan. Well, I said, it's not going to be my plan, so let's do a new plan. Yeah, so plus a new plan. And, you know, I think that's moving us down that road of where we need to be institutionally. But it's it's a... It's an interesting challenge being in an urban area because let's say the pressure of the city on us, the pressure of being in an urban area, the pressure of being part of a destination but not having much of an identity, which is really, I think, our biggest challenge. Mm. It's going to be a lot to chew on and to deal with. Um, that's, you know, that's a big one for us. And, and, and it's one that's always plagued, I think, urban museums. It's a new one for me, so it's going to be interesting to address. How is your how, how have you been thinking through the the just the structure of the strategic plan? I've seen a lot of institutions that are going to, to closer to like one to three year plans rather than these five to ten year big big ordeals. What do you what are your thoughts about that? Oh, I, I'm a huge geek for one to three year plans. First of all, no one could predict COVID. No one could have predict the financial collapse back in 2018. A plan that's longer than that, I can almost guarantee you will get derailed. I also think you have to be nimble enough as an institution to embrace stuff that comes your way. And being so rigid on a five or 10 year plan doesn't work. My planning is really different than most places because I really despise the SWAT. You know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Uh, when I went to the Millicent Rogers Museum, they had paid a consultant um, like $10,000 to come in and do a SWOT analysis. Mm -hmm. And this thing was about this big. It was a phone book. And the, the folks who did it didn't know the first thing about it, the consultants. So they never drew conclusions. Mm -hmm. All they did is said, this is what you need to fix. So on page seven, it said, there's a lot of chewing gum on the wall in the gallery. Four pages later, it said, somebody ought to do something about that wad of chewing gum on the wall. <laughs> 12 pages later, there's a lot of chewing gum on the wall in the gallery. So this happened the year before I got there. I walked over and guess what was still on the wall in the gallery? 
<laughs> open wad of shilling yarn. And the thing was, and I've used this as an example of why that stupid swap thing never works, because what happened was they had never looked at this and said, the wad of chewing gum is, yeah, you can take it off. And in fact, I did take it off. But the issue really was, is the staff had no ownership of the institution. Sure. So they were all pointing at everyone else. He should take the wad of chewing gum off. He should take the wad of chewing gum off. No one had ownership in the staff of what was going on. Nobody had a sense of pride in the institution. It was somebody else's fault that wad of chewing gum was there, as opposed to saying, <clears throat> I am proud of my institution. I'm going to go get that water chewing gum off. Mm -hmm. So it was the difference between being strategic and understanding and being so in the weeds that we were worried about this, you know, a year later, the water chewing gum. So our plan is one page long. You know, mm -hmm. it's a series of manageable action steps mm -hmm. that we're going to take that's in my mind positioning us for our next plan. So we got through everything we have here, which is mostly a lot of inward facing stuff because we've got some stuff to clean up in the house. Then I think we can go to the next step, which is that capital campaign. But we're mm. not anywhere ready for that yet. Mm. And this is at least laying that foundation for where we need to be from a development perspective, from a management perspective, and from a public facing marketing perspective. Mm. Those are our weaknesses. We got to focus on those. We get some of that right or much of that right. Good. And the thing is, I think if we go with a manageable plan, then the board has a sense of accomplishment. It's not that phone book sitting on the shelf that everybody ignores. It's a document that the board goes, yeah, two pages, we got it all done. We're good at strategic planning. Mm. When you have that, then you have a board and staff who are empowered to believe it works. It's a whole lot easier than to go on, as opposed to going, well, about 80% of it we didn't get done because mm. COVID hit. Well, okay, that's fine, but are we going to just keep kicking this down the road, or are we going to lighten the load and be nimble about it? So, yeah, very different in that than a lot of our colleagues who love the phone book. Yeah, and I found that the the, the, the approach you're talking about, it's uh, it it's it's easier and it's more enjoyable to share that that vision with the public and the members. Exactly. They, yeah, they can embrace it. Yeah. It's not rocket science. It's not museum jargon. It's really easy. And it means every board meeting, we review the plan. It means we put it on the website. You can go and see it. It makes it a very easy document to work with. And nobody's sort of just going, yes, there's the plan. And nobody really knows what the heck is <laughs> in it other than the plan and the water chewing gum on the wall, you know? Yeah. I tell you, another thing you, you hit on was knowing the right time and the landscape and the capacity for capital campaigns where sometimes I've seen where the capital campaign for some board members wants to be the solution to the problems rather than creating, you know, working through those issues and then arriving at, you know, what the vision is for a capital campaign. Exactly. Well, and I, what was interesting, I've been with an organization that had done a huge capital campaign before I got there. And the campaign raised an enormous sum of money. But when you parsed it down to look at what it was given for, it was all restricted giving. Mm. So it was a case where no one had looked and said, OK, fine, you've got all these restricted things, these projects you're going to do, but you have no sustainability on the flip side to it. Mm -hmm. You know, you made yourself very happy that you did all this campaign and you raised the low-hanging fruit of convincing people to give restrictive money, but you now don't have the operating money to keep the lights on to actually deliver all these things. And these restricted funds are fine, but there's nothing to support it. And, and I think organizations, I think you're right, they get drunk on having campaigns every couple of years mm -hmm. um, without necessarily always understanding or laying that groundwork for what it it can or should be. And I've made mistakes on campaigns. I've raised too little money when we needed more operating money or more endowment money. And I really do think it's beholden upon us in the professional capacity to really be wise about that. Um, mm -hmm. I know people tend to want to put up that tombstone to themselves that says, I raised 50 gajillion dollars in the capital campaign. And then they quit, quit their job and go on before everybody realized the 50 gajillion dollars was all restricted and now the organization can't keep the lights on but it's got restricted funding 
Yeah. You know, um, and I think we do have an obligation to raise the money that we really need, not just for those special pet capital projects, other projects, but just to keep the damn place going. Yeah. Yeah. And then the the just the sheer uh, energy exhaustion that especially for the leadership of the institution, it, I mean, it, it can take a lot out of you. Um, it does. Well, I'm yeah. sure you've had, and I'm sure all our colleagues have had board members who go, yeah, I walk down the street and friends cross the street and won't talk to me because they know I'm going to ask them for money for the, the museum yeah. slash historical society slash whatever, yeah. you know, they, they, they will, they, they know those bridges have been burned mm. um, and it can take a lot out of people. And, and certainly a director can as well. And I've seen a lot of directors who have just finished a campaign and they're fried. You know, mm -hmm. They're just, they're done um, and have to step away from it. And it is a business, I think, probably that is prone to a lot of burnout for that very reason. Yeah. I think, um, I think you can get fried in it pretty darn easily uh, because, you, you know, it is your vocation and your avocation. It's what you do for fun. It's what you do for work, you can get passionate about that campaign and then you can realize you weren't sleeping well at night and your chest yeah. is a little too tight and <laughs> you know, your sugar level isn't very good and, and it can be a result of that. And I think that's, you gotta be grounded in that stuff. Yeah, Peter, before we uh, wrap up with the lightning round, which is a lot of fun, can, do you wanna um, speak to any trends that you're seeing, especially in, in the development side? Uh, I've, I've, I've been fascinated with, um, we're talking about careers and the shuffle that you see with development directors. And that is just, I mean, it's almost like if you're in a position for three years, you're, <laughs> you've been a longstanding person yeah. on staff. Any thoughts about that just in general development positions and that, and that career path? And it's funny because I've been so many places and we've, we've watched that cycle through. Yeah. And every place I've been has had different challenges in development. In Wyoming, it was, do you want to move to the most rural state in America? Um, if you're young and, and building that career, that's maybe not appealing to you. On the other hand, if you want to be outdoors and crunchy, it does. So there's a lifestyle piece. But I think development, it is tough because relationship building is what development is about. And it puts us on the management side into the challenge of, as we watch people flip through in development those relationships that you have with a donor are built and then taken apart and built and taken apart and built and taken apart. Mm. And that's really challenging. And so to my mind, a long serving gift office, and we had some phenomenal ones at Williamsburg, had that deep abiding relationship and they were incredibly successful. Mm -hmm. How that translates to people who are moving around a lot, I don't know because, you know, as, as someone who hires development people, and I'm trying to hire some right now, I'm trying to find people who are going to be with me for a while and not flipping. I think one thing I do want to touch on in development that I've seen is a shift, particularly here in the East, and I have not seen it before, and it took me really off guard, was how, particularly in the foundational side of it all, how many foundations are now directing the organization that mm -hmm. they're giving funding to, to do what they want to do strategically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen this Watching shift museums who are being pulled away on their mission by the lure of, of big money and the carrot of you take this, but it's the carrot tied to a string, which is you need to, to go down the road we want you to go down. Um, mm -hmm. And that I find distressing. And I've been talking to a lot of colleagues, not just in the museum world, but elsewhere about the power that a lot of foundations seem to be having, both in terms of how they're restricting the use of the funds um, and also about how they really, in many respects, are trying to drive the management of the organizations that they're funding. And, and that I do think is troubling. And that does make me really, really nervous mm. going forward. Uh, it's the tail wagging the dog in a lot of respects. And, and I'm, yeah. I'm not quite sure I know what that answer is. It's just one that I'm finding very uncomfortable. And then to piggyback on that, what I've seen over, in, over the years too, is that there, there, um, sometimes there's even these, uh, these positions that are created with this, with a pool of funds. And then, and then those, 
funds will expire. Well, after a certain time, we're not going to fund that the personnel part of this particular gift. Mm -hmm. And then the institution is left trying to scramble to keep this person on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's interesting to me because it seems like we've become into an era with foundational support where it's all been about project funding. Mm -hmm. So we're going to say to you, we're only going to fund projects that you identify and we agree with, or we identify and you agree to do. And at some point we have to, these, these folks have to say exactly what you said. So fine, we're beefing up our staff to do the project. It's wonderful. Now the money disappears. And do I fire them and this whole thing goes down the toilet? Or do I put my organization into bankruptcy to do this? Mm -hmm. And I, I think at some point on the foundational side, there has to be an acknowledgement that some organizations do have clear missions. If you support the mission, then support the organization without putting the strings on it mm -hmm. and let them decide the best use of that money. There's some trust there that has to be built on both sides. Mm -hmm. but I think it would be a heck of a lot better position than what I see is the very scary mission drift that occurs when organizations are being forced into lanes or going down paths because they have this funder who's tied it up and wants them to do X and it's not really who and what they are. And then the funding disappears and they're, mm -hmm. the whole thing comes apart and it ends up being a waste of money. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we're gonna ready for the lightning round. Tell me, tell me the lightning round. What do I need to do? They're they're always really tough questions. So there's three questions, and you decide whether or not you want to elaborate uh, or or keep silent. So the first question is, you're it's a weekend. Are you watching college football or pro football or or neither? Neither. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm a museum geek, so, you know, I, I was glad to have daughters, so I didn't have to learn to throw a football. <laughs> Come on, I thought you were going to go up to Penn State and sit in traffic for hours in those lanes. And yeah, you know, I never I never had the fascination to, to, to sit in the narrows and wait. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're traveling. Um, do you take a train or a plane? Oh, boy, that's tough, because... I come from a long family of railroaders um, and still have interests in railroading. Okay. So, yeah. But time is precious and probably it's going to end up being the plane. I'm sorry. <laughs> Wait for the lightning bolt to hit me. Um, sorry, <laughs> but you know, if I only have a week for vacation because the museum needs me, yeah. and I better fly to do all the things I want to do. So. I thought it'd be neat to take one of those, uh, you know, take a train car somewhere. I think it would be a neat experience. I, my my in-laws did that when we lived in New Mexico, and um, it was a lot tougher than they imagined it would be. It mm -hmm. really was. And it was funny because I've done a lot of work scholarship on early rail tourism, and I'm fascinated mm -hmm. by Fred Harvey and all that stuff. Big buff on that to see what it is now, which is a microwave hamburger in a little package compared to a, a, you know, a steak dinner with all the, the trimmings. It's come a long, long way. So, uh, <laughs> they, they had a very hard train trip to get from, from Lancaster to, uh, to New Mexico. And what should have been one of the most scenic and beautiful ones ended up sitting on you know sidings waiting for uh, long haul trains going through and, and uh, so on and so forth so plane is the way to go <laughs> yeah I'm sorry to say and again that lightning bolt's going to hit me any second. <laughs> and then finally you're taking a vacation do you go to the beach or the mountains mountains you know although i've lived at both i mean i've been lucky enough to live at the you know work at the beach in virginia and work in the mountains but i'm a mountain guy i, I that would be my preference and that's my, my daughters and my wife and I, we argue this question endlessly. <laughs> Ultimately, we're all mountain people is what we come back to. So that's, I'm not sure what that says. You, you know, analysts could have a real fun time. <laughs> well, Peter Siebert, thank you for your service to um, museums all over the country and also in Pennsylvania and your service on uh, numerous different boards, including uh, PA Museums now and 
um, it's been a real pleasure. And I, and I think that folks are going to enjoy listening to your stories and also taking a, gleaning a lot of uh, good information about just their careers. And I really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. It was, it was awesome. And thanks for doing this. I think there, there's a, actually a real lack of awareness out there of people as they're building their career about what the choices are and what the realities are. There's, mm. So this is a great service that you're doing, I think, putting this out there. Okay, Peter, you take care. Take her easy. Have a good one. Okay, bye.